Edinburgh. Paul is co-founder of the Anti-Nazi League and a long-standing activist. Please welcome Paul. Thank you very much, Chair. And I'd first of all like to thank uh, Chris uh, Wilkinson, the Equal Equalities Office Officer here, and Raj, and then particularly Sunderland United, Newcastle United, and Stand Up to Racism within the North East. Because I think we are all here because we all recognise that we are living in times which none of us have experienced. There are a few people who were around in the 1970s, but let me tell you, I believe the threat from the far right is greater now than it was in the 1970s. Indeed, I would say it's greater than it was in Cable Street and Mosley in the 1930s. Mosley never, it never could turn out 15,000 demonstrators marching through central London, some of them giving Zeke Heil salutes, others of them shouting, we've got to get rid of the Muslims, and so on. Mosley could not achieve that. And therefore, the importance of a united meeting like this, and really the terrible threat of the idea of Tommy Robinson, which I think is certainly a possibility of standing in the Northeast, really underlines the importance of this meeting and the danger which faces us, the danger and the challenge which faces us all. And you see, I think that if we think across the summer, things have happened which underline that. So that in London in particular, but I don't know if you had it in the northeast, just after Easter, the day after Easter, on April the 3rd, there was Punish a Muslim Day. Punish a Muslim Day didn't get a huge amount of publicity. But as Dipu has said, we know and we estimate that probably 100,000, 200,000 Muslim women who didn't go to work that day because they were frightened and they were scared of what was going to happen to them. And when we talk about Islamophobia, we do have to recognize, as Dipu has said, that it's Muslim women that bear the brunt of this. So that in Tooting, for instance, which is a, a largely Muslim area, three weeks ago, two Muslim women were walking down Tooting High Street, somebody came up, or actually a group of people came up, ripped their hijabs off their head, punched them in the face, and said, go home. Now, there are incidents like this happening all the time. Tell Mama, for instance, the organisation that documents attacks on Muslim women, is saying that in the first six months of 2018, there have been over 1,300 documented attacks. Now, this is undoubtedly an underestimate about what, uh, has, uh, uh, what has uh, uh, happened. And of course, in my area in North London, in Islington, it is the first anniversary of the murder of Makram Ali outside Finsbury Park Mosque. And the perpetrator of that foul deed, uh, Darren Osborne, of course openly admitted that he had been radicalised by watching what Tommy Robinson had said on the TV. And it's, what, two and a half years since the murder of Joe Cox by an open Nazi. And then, of course, you move on. I've mentioned already the 15,000 marches, the, the, the uh, well-attended marches of the Football Lads Alliance, Tommy Robinson, and so on. And out of those marches, we all know, comes from a minority violent attacks, again, on uh, Muslims and others. But 
in a way, the most disgusting, the most disgusting event that happened in the summer was the one that Anna referred to. And this is where, well, she, he's not mine, I, I doubt if he's yours, but the Foreign Secretary uh, then was, Boris Johnson, spoke about Muslim women being dressed like bank robbers on the one hand, or letterboxes uh, on the other. And of course, again, there are examples of Muslim women wearing the burqa. Actually, not very many in this country, but <clears throat> some have been treated as though they were a letterbox by the racists. And of course, again, and don't think that Boris Johnson is a jolly fellow who likes a few jokes and a few japes. He plans everything meticulously. Two weeks before he made that speech, he met Steve Bannon. Who's Steve Bannon, as other people have referred to? He is the former chief of staff of Donald Trump. The same Donald Trump who, of course, could not distinguish uh, when a, a young woman was killed at Charlottesville. He could not distinguish between the Nazis and the anti uh, and the anti-Nazis. And it seems to me, therefore, that we are, it is not an exaggeration to say that we are living in a time which none of us have gone through before and I fear is going to get worse before it gets better. And at this, I should also say, of course, that as Islamophobia is peddled by the right-wing press in the ways in which I described, it is also the case there is the rise of an equally foul racism of anti-Semitism. And this year, the documented attacks on, on Jewish graves, on Jewish synagogues, has risen substantially. And therefore, anybody who tries to divide the anti-racist movement by saying that Islamophobia on the one hand, anti-Semitism on the other, is not grasping that the racists feed off the one and then the other, and together they uh, emerge, merge uh, uh, absolutely. And, it's, and therefore, I think we can say that we undoubtedly are seeing echoes of the 1930s. Therefore, propaganda on a huge scale is really important. But I'll tell you something, that the Trump demonstration in central London was fantastic. God knows how big it was. 200,000, whatever, whatever. But we would, and we were all elated after that demonstration. I'm sure many of you came down from Newcastle who had similar demonstrations or whatever. But we would have been terribly depressed if the next day the uh, DFL had managed to march uncontested in central London. And the fact that we turned out, and let me tell you, I'm sure you've been following it, that, you know, uh, 18 months ago, a year ago, they outnumbered us. And on the day after the Trump demonstration, they still outnumbered us, 6,000 of them, 3,000 of us, but we were on the up, and we were much more confident. And last Saturday, I can tell you that the anti-fascists outnumbered the DFL or the DFLA for the first time. They had about 1,500, possibly 2,000. We had about 3,000, 3,500. In other words, our side is now beginning to get organized. They recognize the threat. We all recognize the threat. But we're also saying that on its own, propaganda is not enough. It is vitally important and we have to win the hearts and minds of people who, as people have said, have been ravaged by, uh, by austerity. It's not an accident that Tommy Robinson might well be thinking of standing in the Northeast. He wants to feed on that bitterness and despair. But at the same time, we have to say that wherever, wherever Tommy Robinson, the DFLA, the FLA show their ugly faces, and try and march and try and organize, they are going to face a wall of resistance. They are not going to get away with it. And I, 
I can't guarantee that this is going to happen immediately, but let me tell you, there are meetings like this taking place up and down the country of people who have different political views, many in the Labour Party, some in the Socialist Workers' Party, others in no organisations, and they are in a way the most important uh, section of people, the non-aligned. They all recognise the danger and they want to do something about it. That film we saw at the beginning was really moving. To see Martin Luther King was fantastic because, and how he finishes it, and I noted down what he said. He said that justice will roll down like water, but righteousness like a mighty stream. We are going to build that stream, brothers and sisters. Thank you very much.